welcome to Run With It, a show on running, fitness, and health. We are filming this month's episode at the BC Sports Hall of Fame. If you've never been to the BC Sports Hall of Fame, you want to check out the Hall of Champions, the Terry Fox Gallery, and lots more. On this month's show, we have a segment on winter running and safety tips, along with some fitness advice to follow despite a busy work schedule. And for those ladies out there who are planning to get married, you want to check out this segment later in the show on the Bride Fit Challenge. But first, let's go to our in-studio interview with Olympian Mayhel Ricker. With me in the studio is four-time Olympian Mayel Ricker, who brought women snowboarding to the forefront at the 2010 Vancouver Olympics. She's the first Canadian woman to win a gold medal on home soil in her discipline, snowboard cross. She's here today to talk about her passion for the sport, competing in the next Winter Olympics, and following a healthy lifestyle. Welcome to the show, Mayel. Thank you. Thank so you for having, having me. Here. <laughs> so now let's talk about when you started snowboarding. What made you decide? Well, I had to follow Big Brother, of course, but <laughs> I have a brother who's two years older than me, and we both used to ski race when we were kids, and he sort of switched over and started looking for powder, going to try jumps and tricks, and it looked like tons of fun, so I just sort of tried to copy him and follow him down the hill, and of course, you know, being the competitive spirit that I am, I always wanted to like try and go higher than him on the jumps or do bigger cliffs or be faster, so right away I sort of got the bug for competitive snowboarding right from the get-go. <laughs> and you were, you were 13 at the time, and you yeah, just yeah. got a taste of it? Exactly, yeah, so I mean, I definitely grew up always being in the mountains and I love being in the mountains, being outside and then finding this whole other passion of snowboarding in the mountains. But a little bit later on compared to the young riders nowadays, I mean, you can, we've got snowboard setups for one year olds even. <laughs> oh my goodness, mm -hmm. that's great. So yeah. when, uh, when was your first competition? Uh, probably when I was 14 or 15, I can't, <laughs> nailed down the exact date but it was it was the local series up at Whistler and so much fun it was uh, half pipe competition and of course I was there with I was part of a club and uh, my brother Yearly was part of it and then I also had some really good friends now looking back that I spent many years on the national team with uh, Natasha Zurich for example and we all sort of started out competing in those local competitions up at the hill. Tell us about your work with Kids Sport and Jump Start. Well, <laughs> it's actually a ton of fun because if I think back to, to uh, my childhood growing up, it was all about sports. I was in a family that really supported sports. I, was, I definitely lived in an area that, that um, I was fortunate enough to be able to just participate and do any sort of sport that I chose. I was really lucky. but. Um, not everybody has that financial opportunity and I think this is what's so great about organizations like Kids Sport and Jumpstart with the Canadian Tire family is they've created these uh, charitable organizations that allow all kids to play basically that's the Kids Sport motto so all kids can play and basically it gives out grants and um, financial funding to uh, families that can't necessarily pay for the soccer fees or or pay for the new equipment for the team and it there's all these different ways basically to get get all kids outside and get them playing and get them active and just all part of that like healthy living that we we love as Canadians and you feel good about it about your work and and that's that's wonderful it is and it's fun you know it's it's um it's really great to be a part of organizations that it's it's I mean it's a ton of fun we did a we did a kids sport challenge in the fall in September and I mean oh, you're just out there and you're just having a great time so it's it's not only about giving back but it's about helping others and having a great time doing it at the same time it's like a win-win situation for everybody when was your first Olympics uh, well, <laughs> really dating myself here. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> um, in 1998, in, in Nagano, actually. So I was very lucky, I'd say, to be in the right place at the right time because it was, of course, the first time snowboarding had gone to the Olympics. And it was not too far after I graduated high school. And 
I thought, hey, what a great opportunity to sort of combine my love of sport and sort of my competitive spirit with my love of snowboarding and that whole mountain lifestyle. And it just sort of ended up working out perfectly for me. And was this the half pike event in 1998? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. In 98 uh, and 2002 Olympics was only half pipe and uh, giant slalom. And then uh, starting in 2006 is when snowboard cross first got into the games in Turin. Yeah. So tell me, describe snowboard cross. It's like motocross. Is that right? <laughs> See, I'm not sure the motocrossers would appreciate me comparing it to that, but there are similarities. It is it is about a mass start, so there's four or six people at the start, and the gate drops, and then it's all about who gets to the finish line the fastest. So it's quite simple to follow, and it's fun to watch because of that, but there's big rollers and jumps and bank turns as you make your way down the course, and it's uh, not necessarily a time thing. It's more of a being either the top two or the top three in your heat so you can move on to the next either quarterfinals or semifinals or finals that day. Well, how high do you go? <laughs> it looks pretty high to me. <laughs> well, it looks... it's actually, it depends on the course, right? Because not, not one course is the same. So sometimes there's a steeper course that'll be faster. Sometimes there'll be a course that's maybe has more jumps. So then you'll be going farther in the air. Sometimes it's a really quick technical course where there's lots of leg movements, lots of rollers. So it really depends on the course. But I'd say generally you can get up to about um, 100K an hour going into some of those big jumps at the bottom of the hill. And um, yeah, it, some of those jumps can be up to 20, 30 meters in distance. So you're, uh, you're, you're, spending, you're, having, you're spending some good time in the air. But it's not like um, the freestyle side of snowboarding. In that way, it's different because for us, it's all about getting to the finish line first. So you're not necessarily going for big, high, lofty airs. You're looking for the fastest way to travel through the air to get to the next feature so you can be faster than your other competitors on the course. What's your training regime? Well, there's there's quite a vif there's quite a few different angles to the training because there's we spend a lot of time on snow just simply carving, like learning really really trying to get proper technique and learning how to use our board and how to make the board glide fast and then there's also the technique of jumping. But Beyond all of that, there's there's race tactics of how you'd race on your own versus how you'd race against others. And then, of course, there's the whole strength and conditioning side of it as well. So, I mean, there's mental preparation, there's physical preparation, there's tactical preparation, there's there's uh, technical preparation. I mean, there's there's a lot of different training that goes on. And do you spend a lot of time, like, on the bike and in the gym, that kind of thing? I do actually, and I, I really love it. Like it's it's tons of fun. I I come down to North Van in the off season. We do quite a bit of gym training. We do spend a lot of time on the bike, especially in season, warming up, cooling down before and after we get on snow. And there's a lot of weight training as well. So different types of Olympic lifting or plyometrics or just general strength training. So. There's a, there's a lot that goes into it because it's one thing, you have to be really good technically on your snowboard, but then you also have to be really well conditioned to not only prevent injury, but also so you can, you can last. And then you can use sort of your experience from all these years of racing with, with yeah. keeping a healthy body. And then you're, you're able to, I guess, uh, have a longer career in, in the sport. And talk about your 2010 Winter Olympics. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. How was that for you? Yeah, it was okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. No, so no. I'm just, just joking. I know. <laughs> no, it was, it was, honestly, it was something Sorry. that I, I mean, obviously, I'm never, ever going to forget to have the chance to participate in the Olympics and then let alone one that was in my backyard. I mean, I went to school in West Vancouver and then was competing just up at Cyprus, right behind my house. So it's very, very fortunate to be able to have a chance to do that and then also be in a spot where I can contend for the podium. So I, I don't know, I just managed to win some sort of crazy lucky lottery ticket to participate in that. And then of course, being in Vancouver and being up at Whistler for all the different events and parties and celebrations after I raced was so much fun. It's <laughs> heavy as I'm holding it here. <laughs> Where do you keep it? I just keep it in my drawer. I mean, I, it definitely gets shared a lot. Like that's the whole thing. It's it's 
if you ask any Olympian about their medal, I think they'd say that it's it's not their medal, it's Canada's medal. So it gets it gets passed around a lot, and the more people that I think people feel maybe sometimes shy about asking to see it, but that's like the best thing ever when people want to touch it or they want to put it around their neck or they want to take pictures with their kids. Like that's what makes it so much fun and why it's such a coveted thing to go after. <laughs> Congratulations. And Thank you. What is next for you? Well, <laughs> just getting ready for the season here. Um, There's a bit of a slow start this year, sort of the post-Olympic year, it always that four-year cycle starts up again. So uh, the main bulk of our competition season starts in January. We have uh, World Championships and the Winter X Games and our World Cup Tour. And just I'm um, really looking forward to getting back on snow. I mean, it's just really, it's just really what I love. I just eat, breathe, bleed. I love, I love being on my board. I love being in that mountain culture and being outside in the fresh air, it's just, uh, it's always going to be a part of me. You feel so alive. <laughs> I do, you yes. Do. But you, you are planning to um, go to the next Olympics? Yes. <laughs> we'll see. I wanted to hear yes. that. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I definitely, I'm not saying yes or no either way, 100% for sure, but right now, the Olympics is, it's a big part of it, but it's not the end all and be all. It's about what I was just saying before. It's the whole lifestyle and culture around the snowboarding. Like if somebody were to ask me about the 2010 competition and what was the most memorable, and I can say in a heartbeat without even thinking twice, the, the journey to, to get to that point. I mean, traveling with my teammates and seeing the world and being able, I mean, being able to go out and experience all these different mountain cultures from Japan to South America to Europe, I mean, it's just such an amazing opportunity. So that's, that's really what, why I'm in it and not just for those moments every four years. <laughs> yes. Do you have a favorite country? That well, here in BTS. Yes. <laughs> No, I, 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 I enjoy... Uh, you I speak really French, right? I do, yeah. yes. Yes, I was uh, in French immersion in school, so I'm able to take that, actually, to to my life now. It's really great. My, my coach is actually from France, so I get a lot of my instruction on Hill in French, and then I have... Um, I've met a lot of friends from France, Switzerland, and Quebec. My, my main teammate and competitor, Dominique Maltese, from Quebec, so we'll... We'll be speaking French throughout the year, so I'm so I'm so happy my parents enrolled me in that program in school because it's been a huge benefit for uh, what I do. <laughs> Wonderful, and let's uh, tell us about your healthy lifestyle. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> oh <no. laughs> what do you want to know? <laughs> well, do you like coffee? Oh. Eggnog? <laughs> do you I know. I'm such. That was that's so funny. We were just talking about that. Well. I definitely enjoy my morning coffees. I mean, I know that everything in moderation, but especially when I'm when I'm home in Squamish and I'm driving down to North Van for training, like having that that morning cup of joe when I'm driving down to the gym is really really nice. But that being said, I mean, there's certain things that I always kind of always end up eating in the mornings before I race. Like I always try and have a banana wherever I am in the world. It seems like my like home staple comfort food. And, and um, I also really enjoy uh, just making salads. Like I love just throwing everything in the kitchen sink into my salad at night and having stuff like that. So, I mean, I definitely have my vices as well. But <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think being in an activity or in a job that requires you to use your body all the time, it, it, I think it automatically allows you to eat healthier too. You just can't afford to fuel your body with a bunch of crap because you have to you have to keep your body going so you can keep doing what you're doing. Well, I want to wish you luck in all your competitions and thank you so much for coming on the show and I'd like to have you come back. Well, thank you very much. I'd love to see you again. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> it was fun. Yeah, great. <laughs> Thanks. Happy holidays. Yeah, you too. <laughs>
If you're new to running or you need that extra motivation to run in the colder months, John Stanton, founder of The Running Room, gives us some winter running tips. This time of year, there's a couple of things that are really key and really important. We have to remember is because it's darker, uh, being seen is most important in the winter time because when you're running, often we're sharing the roads with cars. So wearing reflective gear, you know, gear like I've got on with reflective strips on it is very important. Dressing in layers is really important, you know, and most of us know that you want to wear technical products today, products that wick that sweat and moisture away from you to keep you dry. Keeping dry is half the battle. Uh, you know, the reflective gear is important, but you also want a, a, a shell like I've got on today that keeps the elements out, keeps the rain, the wind, the sleet off of you. And then you have a thermal layer underneath that'll keep you warm. And you've got another layer right near your body that's going to be wickable. That's going to get the sweat and moisture off your skin so that you stay warm and you don't chill up when you're out there. And you know, we lose a, a, about 50% of our heat loss goes through our head and our hands. And you'll see runners in the wintertime, particularly here on the West Coast, you'll see them out and they've got a toque and a pair of mitts and a pair of shorts on and you go why have they got mitts and toque on and shorts but that the thing is is that if you keep your hands keep your head warm that's half the battle sometimes in staying warm while you're out there well the resolution run is a great run the bonus is you get a jacket and it, you get this nice fleece jacket that everybody has to wear and it's on new year's day it's done at 10 o'clock a very civilized time of the day to run it's not like a lot of races where you got to get up early in the morning so it's a great time to go out people do it as couples they do it with buddies and they it's more like a group run than anything else the nice part about getting out and exercising is it re-energizes us. It gives us that uplifting feeling that we get from exercise. At the same time, make sure you have that resolution, a new year of what you're going to start on, and a goal, because that goal will help uh, sustain that discipline throughout the holiday season. Balancing a healthy lifestyle can be a challenge. Kaylee, owner of Hype Hair Salon, talks about how she juggles work and an active lifestyle. Check this out. Um, and then I, I actually, um, it's interesting because I never understood 
how people could live without exercise or not um, make time for exercise. And when I first bought the salon and had my first child, um, exercise really fell to the side um, and I really didn't feel my best. So I started to look for ways to incorporate it into my work life and um, you know, home life. Um, because it does, when you get too many pieces, it is really hard to keep it in. Um, and I think that's the key, is to find something that you're committed to, that's easy for you, that doesn't take you too off track of your daily routine. And Kaylee, any tips for people leaving a busy lifestyle like yourself? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the one that's really great is to get a personal trainer. Um, because then you have an appointment that you're committed to. Um, it's really easy to say, I'm going to the gym at 4, and then you get busy, and then it's 4.30 and you haven't made it, and your workout gets bumped out. Um, so if you really say, um, you know, commit to a trainer just to get you started, then you know you have that appointment and you can't miss it. Well, what inspires me is um, just feeling my best and helping other people to feel their best. And like I said, you know, human nature, we don't want to do it. We don't want to get up and get out in the rain or go do that workout at the gym. So you have to find ways to set yourself up for success. And in saying that, I mean, you know, have, have a buddy that you work out with so that you can meet them and you're not going to let them down. It's easy, easier to say like, oh, I'm not going to go. But if you know someone's waiting for you, then you're going to go. Or have that trainer that you're going to meet and really set yourself up to win. Um, if you go to a gym that's a block in the opposite direction from going home after work, it's really easy not to go. So you might want to pick one that's en route on your way home. Um, or a class that you really love. Or just simply park further from work and walk in. Or take the stairs instead of the escalator. Just little things to start yourself on the way to feeling good. And then you'll see how you feel good and you'll start to look for more ways to make yourself feel at even better. And eating healthy too. And eating healthy. And my one rule is never leave the house without breakfast. Because uh, I think, you know, you can kind of survive missing lunch, but if you miss breakfast, you really start to feel your energy gets low throughout the day, and your body really can't function without getting that first meal to kickstart. And, you know, if you do feel good after working out. Yes. And if you I think everybody agrees yes. that they feel really great after. It's just getting yourself <laughs> there is the key. And if you don't work out, how do you feel, Kaylee? I can't live without working out. I, it has to be part of my life. At least two to three times a week is a minimum for me. Um, I, I just can't function well without having that exercise. It's a stress relief. It helps keep everything else intact. So. Yes. And you can have it all. You really can. It's I think so. That exercise time in. I think it's making it really important and putting a priority and a commitment on it. And, and that's the way we did it here. That's what brought on our boot camp is um, I did have the passion for fitness and I really wanted to you know make it part of what we do so we started this boot camp with our team and that again you know it's we're committed to it it's fun um, it's something that we all enjoy and that we can do together. Yes. It's wonderful. Our next big thing as a team is we want to do Tough Mudder and Whistler. Awesome. So that's what we're training for now. We've got a bunch of the girls here that are gearing up for that so that's going to be a whole new experience. <laughs> Thank you. Really on your health and fitness and your career, and I wish you luck in the tough mutter. Thank you. We're gonna need it. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank Kaylee. you. Thanks for taking the time to come out here and see what we do. It's Was something that um, I wanted to do with our wedding fair company to give back to the brides because that's what our business is and so the bride fit challenge was created because of that. My role is a personal trainer and support system for the girls. Because the bride fit challenge isn't just about fitness. We, w we didn't want to just have it just about fitness. It's about health and fitness for the rest of your life. Creating a, a lifestyle. So lifestyles start with your parents and so when your parents are fit and healthy they impart that into their children. So that's what we wanted for the Bride Fit Challenge because as the beginning of your, your parental, it's uh, weddings and your wedding becomes the bride and groom, then becomes the parent. So then if it starts there, it imparts right into your rest of your family. The Bride Fit Challenge, we just finished our 2014 challenge. The final challenge was in November. Um, and then we now are starting for January 10th and 11th at Wedding Fair we're going to start our 2015 challenge. It's how many votes that you get on Facebook, that's who determines 
the last 12 finalists who we choose. 2015 was an equally amazing emotional story where the two runners up, they tied for first place. Yes. And one of them acquiesced and said, I, she worked so hard, the other girl, Elena. Elena. Elena and Liz. and Liz. And Liz said, Elena, I want you to have this. And I mean, I don't think there was a dry eye in the room. No. It was no, everyone, so cool. And, and um, because um, Elena had a lot also challenges that she had to overcome that some of the other girls didn't have to deal with. And, and she herself lost 27 pounds. Yeah. It's a great challenge. We have just incredible sponsors. The Pinnacle Hotel is our big sponsor. They are our home. They sponsor the, the, the challenge, final the challenge. final challenge, where we have, you know, all, all spectators are welcome. They come, they cheer, and it's a great venue. The Pinnacle is just a great venue. I want to thank you very much. Thank you for having us. I'm going to cry a minute. So, um, Liz graciously does not want to win the contest. She wants Elena to win the contest. Thanks for watching. If you have a question or comment on today's show, go to our website on the screen. Until next time, run with it.